on the lonely Berkshire Downs, Ashdown House is Dutch in inspiration. Tall, narrow, softened by two detached pavilions and quite unlike any other English country house. The builder, the first Earl of Craven, died a bachelor in 1697 at the age of 89, having spent most of his life in devotion to the love of his life, Charles I's sister Elizabeth, also known as the Winter Queen, for the one season when she ruled as Queen of Bohemia. Construction had begun in 1662, but sadly she died before it was completed. The name of the architect is uncertain, but it is thought that the Earl commissioned Captain William Wind to build the Dutch-style mansion in a secluded setting as a refuge from the plague. The captain was an interesting character whose expertise during his military career led to him later specialising as a conductor or as we would more likely say today, a coordinator of the building works for the country houses of English gentlemen. Renowned 20th century English architectural historian Howard Colvin said, Wind ranks with Hook, May, Pratt and Talman as one of the principal English country house architects of the late 17th century. As the 17th century was coming to a close in England, there was still no separate profession of architecture in evidence. Any educated man of taste could try his hand at it. Many noble patrons were busy supervising their own building works and the names of their consulting builders and workers were not always recorded at this time. The Seymour family of Somerset had been staunch supporters of the Protestant succession since the reign of Elizabeth I. The sixth Duke, Charles Seymour, was another of the noblemen who had invited William and Mary to take the throne of England. Known as the Proud Duke because of his arrogance, Charles Seymour hoped he would be offered a high office of state. It did not happen, so he retired to the country, carrying out renovations to his house located in the market town of Petworth in West Sussex. These were conceived on a grand scale, demonstrating the continuity of his wife's family, the fabulously wealthy, well-connected family from Northumberland, the Percys. Petworth House was remodelled between 1688 and 1693. The 14th century chapel was preserved at all cost. A large inventory conducted of the house in the early 1690s reveals that it was richly furnished with silver furniture, red gilt leather hangings and striped Indian damask lined with yellow taffeta in the Duchess's bedroom. There were also many tapestries that were inherited from the Percy family through marriage. There was a devastating fire in 1714 but the Great Hall of State survived and we can still enjoy the view down the enfilade to the North Gallery. The alignment was intended to impress by its length and diminished perspective, forming an ideal setting for the formal processions that preceded a great man's rituals. These included the nobleman's levee, a ceremony held every morning as he dressed. The rituals surrounding his dinner, which was taken at three in the afternoon, as well as his coucher, a reception held at the time of going to bed. The original decoration had grand French and Dutch Baroque style decorative features, found rarely in other English houses from this time. The mouldings were carved deliberately over life size, their scale increasing towards the ceiling to give a feeling of grandeur. Over the chimney piece, the Duke of Somerset's arms were designed by Daniel Marrow and carved by John Selden. Daniel Marrow's visits to Petworth House in West Sussex are recorded and in the marble hall the giant acanthus mouldings around the doorways have a theatricality worthy of a Baroque stage designer, which was another of his talents 
and duties that he performed at court. This was the space where servants and visitors waited to be summoned into the presence of the master of the house. It was the room that established that from the moment you arrived, the residents, families, rank and status. We know about the plan of the house during the time of the sixth duke because it is recorded as part of the details in a great mural commissioned from Huguenot painter Louis Laguerre after the fire of 1714. This extraordinary work fills the walls of the grand staircase and depicts the Duchess of Somerset riding in a triumphal chariot attended by her children. During the reign of William and Mary, social life became far more complex and a display of good taste by the fashionable elite was a primary social virtue. There was a growing emphasis on a community of manners and tastes, profoundly transforming the nature of the pleasure people took in eating and drinking in company. The use of individual plates, glasses, knives, spoons and forks were adopted by the social elite and the use of fingers finally forbidden. This social distinction was inaugurated by those surrounding the king as well as other leading nobles who used the possession of fashionable utensils as a social marker, widening the gap between the elite and everyone else. At first, all the cargoes from the East were bound together under the generic description Indian because they were brought out of China, overland to the Coromandel Coast in India where they were crated and shipped to England and Europe. It was John Evelyn in his diary of 1679 who first described the great Chinese lacquer screens coming into Europe and England as Coromandel screens. Many of these had scenes of lovely ladies disporting themselves in beautiful gardens and pavilions. They were usually surmounted and supported by deep borders of floral decoration. Highly desirable, the screens as well as protecting the nobility from the drafts that came in as the doors were opened and closed by servants, were also often cut up and fitted as panels into intimate rooms such as the Black Lacquer Cabinet at Drayton in Northamptonshire, which was redecorated around 1700. The borders were also reserved and made up into exotic small cabinets for collections of cameos or storage of jewellery. They were placed onto stands that were either exuberantly carved or given a japanned finish. Japanning was a craft technique that was developed to imitate exotic Eastern lacquer. In 1688, the method was minutely described in a publication called A Treatise of Japanning and Varnishing by John Stalker and George Parker. John and George probably gleaned their information from Dutch and Huguenot craftsmen. Whatever, Japanning became the rage for those with time on their hands, and as that was only those people with the ready necessary, having a house filled with lovely lacquerwares became another indication of wealth and status. The English worker used quite different materials from the original lacquer worker from the East, and a growing dearth of designers produced books of their suggestions for the amateur Japaner to copy from. For those who did not purchase real deal Coromandel screens, there was the option of filling your walls by japanning your preferred design onto another backing, such as leather hangings. Descriptions for production were easily understood, instruments clearly stated, and although it may often thought to be a complicated technique, it was easy enough that it became a fashionable pastime, with the delightful extra possibilities of lacquering small boxes, cases and all sorts of containers that could be given as gifts. Jarrett Jensen became a name well known as one of the most accomplished of the Anglo-Dutch cabinet makers 
who had a major impact on furniture design during the latter years of the 17th century. He settled in London after 1680 and was employed as a cabinet maker to the royal household during four reigns from Charles II to Queen Anne. Jensen is notable for his fine arabesque marquetry and brass inlay, similar to that of Frenchman André Charles Boulle. Jensen especially excelled at the new art of Japanning. This fabulous pair of chairs from Mallet Antiques of both London and New York are a great example of Japan wares. They are also of a shape inspired by designs for chairs by Daniel Marrow. The restrained colours of their decoration is both elegant and highly desirable. The detail reveals the delicacy of the work on a new and complex shape of a style of chair leg used by ancient Chinese and Greeks that emerged in Europe during the last few years of the 17th century and particularly the first 30 years of the 18th century. Known as the cabriole, which derives from the French word cabriola, to leap like a goat, it became highly fashionable, as did opening up rooms to endless space through the art of painted trompe l'oeil. The very fine examples of this art of tricking the eye still in existence was accomplished by a handful of artists at the time. They included the French men Louis Laguerre and Louis Chiron, the Englishman James Thornhill and the Fleming Gerard Lanscroon, whose work can be seen on the walls of the stone staircase at Drayton. It was built between 1702 and 1705 and the ironwork balustrade is believed to be another by Master Huguenot ironworker Jean Tijoux. Landscroon's painting is particularly enhanced by the figures falling out over the plinth. In the painted room at Cannons Ashby, the cornice and architrave are flat pieces of timber used as pilasters. Their cut-out capitals are given the illusion of being three-dimensional by trompe painting. These sombre, rich, deep colours were very fashionable in Baroque interiors. They offered a sense of solid comfort and well-being and they were very different from the great chambers and long galleries of Elizabethan and Jacobean houses. Panelled rooms were painted or grained to look like marble or rockwork and lime washed plaster ceilings were decorated with garlands of fruit and flowers. It was all about making your own little nest a place of surprise and delight because it was possible to spend a great deal of time indoors due to the vagaries of the weather. The Italian painter Antonio Verrio, 1636-1707, completed many commissions in the English countryside, including at Burley House, the favoured residence of the Cecil family. The house was undergoing changes during the occupancy of the 5th Earl, a tireless collector who patronised many great craftsmen. Berio and his hangers-on lived for 11 years with the family at the Duke's expense while he completed the only room he ever painted from ceiling to floor with lifelike scenes from ancient mythology. Burley is another treasure house with a collection of ceramics. These include blue and white wares and those in the Kakiemon palette. Sakaida Kakiemon 1599-1666 was one of the most famous of all Japanese porcelain makers and he used a specific colour palette and style of decoration on his wares which arrived in England after 1644. The colours have become synonymous with his name orange red, green, lilac blue, yellow, turquoise and gold, while the decoration was painted asymmetrically and rather sparsely, enhancing a prominent white background. 
The diarist Samuel Pepys, 1633 to 1703, imported cottons to hang on the walls of his wife's study. He also recorded he had an India gown made of cotton, which he called chink in his diary. Indian cottons or calico were named after Calicut on the Malabar coast of India, where they were collected for shipping. The lightness of the cotton cloth was an absolute novelty in England and it was in great demand for bed hangings because of its colour fastness and washability. The cloth was block printed and its colours set fast with mordants, a method known in the Mediterranean world in ancient times, but one that had been lost to England and Europe for centuries. By this time, English textile printers could quickly master techniques for printing their own designs on calico. It was keeping a variety of colours that remained during laundering that for them became a big problem. As a result, for the time being, the fast palette of colours available for locally produced goods were limited to brown, black, purple and the most popular colour, red. Cruel stitch embroidery on the more expensive linen cloth using wool thread in a colour palette of blues, greens and browns was an acquired taste. Motives were taken from pattern books and when finished the cloth was made into bed trappings. This was an entirely new look and heralded the arrival of understated elegance. Following the revocation of the Edict of Nantes in 1685, Hundreds of Huguenots of Guivers from Lyon had smuggled themselves out of France hidden in bales of straw or empty beer barrels and wine vats being shipped across the Channel. Their arrival at Spitalfields in the east of London led to the founding of a weaving industry in that place. The Huguenots had a belief in the virtues of hard work, thrift and self-discipline. They saw their business success as a sign of God's grace, and they worked hard and prospered. They also taught the locals too, so they could expand the trade, and built handsome row houses with glassed, ceilinged workshops in the attic where they set up their weaving looms. They brought to England with them a newly invented technique that allowed them to give thin silk taffeta, a glossy luster, which was a distinct advantage over other imported products. By the time of the turn of the century, books were by now of significant importance, especially in great country treasure houses where they brought knowledge into a social sphere that valued it as integral to wielding both power and influence. Book bindings became increasingly attractive, detailing the name of the book and its author, and it became desirable that their spines could be seen. The English diarist Samuel Pepys established the most quintessential of all English rooms, the library, at the end of the 17th century. He stored his books behind panes of glass to protect them from dust, known to be the most invasive of all mites and the enemy of both textiles and books. If this was not possible and books were left open to the air, fringing was employed on the facing edge of shelving to flick the dust off when the books were withdrawn. Daniel Marrow designed pull-up curtains, or festoons we call them, a sturdy desk and a comfortable easy chair with wings that protected the occupant from draughts and these became integral aspects of a library and its decoration. As in the previous century, beds were the single most important piece of furniture in the house. Marrow's designs were masterpieces of the upholsterer's art, setting a trend for great state beds in England. The most sophisticated example by Marrow, his upholsterer and fringe maker, comes from Melville House in Fife, and it is now in the V&A Museum at London. The bedposts were entirely hidden by hangings made of luxurious crimson velvet, and the headboard itself was ornamented by the upholder 
who also trimmed the chosen fabric with fringes and tassels. Made of oak, the Melville bed is high, imposing and richly decorated, and bears the monogram CMG on the headboard. The interior of the bed is lined with oyster coloured damask of Chinese origin. It bears an inscription on the selvage edge, detailing instructions delightfully on how to attach the braid and fringe. William and Mary bought Nottingham House in 1689 to provide a London base. It was their own urban retreat, very near to the town, where he could escape to cleaner air because of his asthma. A large labour force planted a massive number of trees, plants and flowers worth about £700. Now known as Kensington Palace, the Southern Gardens were installed by William and Mary to an unusual plan in 1691. William, like so many men of his time, maintained a long-lasting affair with Elizabeth Villiers, one of Mary's ladies-in-waiting. He often seemed indifferent on the surface to Mary, according to all reports. However, his deep grief over her death from smallpox in 1694 indicated just how much he had come to rely upon her and his respect for her opinions and strength. In mid-1699, following a five-year period of melancholy, mourning and sadness, he decided to complete the gardens at Hampton Court that he and Mary had started together. The largest works were to be highly polished walks along which members of the court could stroll. When the broad walk and pavilion terrace were completed, it was possible to walk about a mile in the same direction. One of the greatest problems was the continuing failure of the fountains to function effectively. It caused a great drain on William's financial resources when new lead pipes were installed in 1700 to 1701. An arbour was incorporated by a carpenter into the wall between the Broad Walk and Hampton Court Road, and a small garden southeast of the new banqueting house was transformed into the King's Avery, containing a collection of exotic birds with clipped wings. As the 17th century drew to a close, London coffee houses were becoming places for important conversations about a whole range of political and business issues. Coffee was a new drink enjoyed mainly by men seeking to escape the drunken company of those who inhabited the taverns. It was often dispensed from great silver urns like this one in the shape of a great garden vase from Versailles. They now sought a place where they could put forward their ideas on a variety of subjects and many coffee houses would become haunts for the dilettanti or those striving to climb the ladder of success and be recognised as a gentleman in a world of complex social layers. One of these was the young and ambitious Lord Carlisle, who in 1699 commissioned an acquaintance of his from the Kit Kat Club, a haunt of the Whig grandees, John Vanbrugh, to draw up classical designs for his new country house. John Vanbrugh was a colourful character who had been imprisoned in the Bastille at Paris in 1691 on suspicion of being a spy. After abandoning military life, John Vanbrugh enjoyed considerable success as a playwright of restoration style comedies. Then, as luck would have it, he met the perfect collaborator and business colleague in Nicholas Hawksmoor, who had studied architecture under Sir Christopher Wren, still considered the best trained professional architect of his day. There is no doubt that Castle Howard in Yorkshire is probably the most dramatic of all the great treasure houses in England and Wales. John Vanbrugh and Nicholas Hawksmoor transformed the bushes, bogs and briars of Yorkshire 
as Van Brugh himself put it, into a classical Arcadia, crowned by a classical dome. The house and all its outbuildings are made of a local stone that mellows to a rich gold with age. It is an extraordinary example of the Baroque style in England, with its now characteristic use of giant classical order, an emphasis on projection and recession, an impressive and dramatic display climaxing in either a central dome or a block with corner towers. At the centre of the house is a great room, 70 foot high and 52 feet square. Its co-joined square columns support a great dome and cupola, which were painted. The fireplace is by Italian Stuccatori, Baguti and Pluara, their first recorded work in England. The black and white floor is by John Thorpe of Derbyshire, while the wrought iron balcony is by John Gardon, a pupil of the French wrought iron worker Jean Tijou, whom he had assisted at Chatsworth. Vanbrugh's ingenious and innovative corridor was a great feature, rather than a utilitarian aspect of Castle Howard. Filled with wonderful sculpture, it represents the idea that your ancestry was important because it stretched all the way back to antiquity. During his reign, William spent most of his life locked in a competition and confrontation with Louis XIV that was a no-win situation. They continually misunderstood each other's intentions, which only served to frustrate and increase their distrust of each other. William earnestly believed that God had assigned him the task of stopping Louis's ambition of being supreme monarch of Europe. He did, however, do his best to end the Nine Years' War with France, and the Peace of Ryswick was signed on his and England's behalf at the Ryswick Palace in the Netherlands in 1697 by the Earl of Portland, William's ambassador to Louis XIV at Versailles. An enduring legacy that William shared with Mary was set in concrete the year before her death. On February 8, 1693, they had both signed the charter to establish the William and Mary College at Virginia in America. Sir Christopher Wren designed the main building for a perpetual college of divinity, philosophy, languages and other good arts and sciences. And it was constructed from 1695 before the town of Williamsburg even existed. During his last long eight years on the throne of England without Mary, William's popularity had sunk to an all-time low. It was late in the afternoon in February 1702 that when he was riding his favourite horse Sorrel in the Wilderness Garden at Hampton Court that it lost its footing, throwing him heavily and breaking his collarbone. The injury contributed to his very painful death on the 8th of March from the added complication of pneumonia. His death also brought an end to the House of Orange in the Netherlands as he and Mary died without heirs and he was buried at Westminster Abbey alongside his wife. His wife Mary's younger sister Anne, who was to succeed him, was left to deal with all the unpaid bills for the Royal Gardens. She was very angry, refusing to pay the tradesmen, including wrought iron worker Jean Tijoux, who was owed £1,889, a massive sum of money in those days. After everything calmed down, it was Anne's sensible husband, Prince George of Denmark, who commissioned Leonard Niff to complete a series of drawings of the virtually completed gardens of William and Mary of Orange at Hampton Court for both the royal collection and posterity. Excessive topiary has often been described as a Dutch vice and the extreme may have been Hampton Court in its day. However it is at South Cumbria in the north of England where we find a unique surviving example of a formal garden of the era of William and Mary. 
Following a career at court in the service of King James II, Levens Hall became the property of Colonel James Graham in 1688. He arrived home with a young French gardener in tow. Guillaume Beaumont had been a pupil of André Le Nort at Versailles, and he designed and planted a garden whose elements would display the exuberant characteristics that became associated with the garden art, design and style in the reign of William and Mary. Opened as a recreational park in 1700, Levens Hall seems to be frozen in time. Its great oak avenue, ancient clipped yew trees and sensational specimen trees are now among the oldest cultivated trees in the world. At the time of William III's death in 1702, formality was giving way to a more enlightened appreciation of nature in all its moods, something that the Lake District poets like William Wordsworth would explore in years to come. One impulse from a vernal wood may teach you more of man, of moral evil and of good, than all the sages can. Sweet is the law which nature brings, our meddling intellect misshapes the beauteous forms of things with murder to dissect. Enough of science and of art, close up those barren leaves, come forth and bring with you a heart that watches and receives.